you know, the Bible tells us that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? All your soul and all your strength. And one of the words I would highlight in that thing that, that Jesus said, he said, with. There's something that I have. There's something that you have. Matter of fact, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. How many things did I just mention there? Three. How many part, you're a three-part being. You're created in the image and likeness of God. You, have a, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in this, in this body. But there's, he's saying you are to love the Lord your God with all your being. As a matter of fact, when you break those down, I love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your, your soul, and all your strength. You, could, you, should, you and I should be able to attach um, uh, something to that. In other words, strength, you could attach uh, what would be, that would be your, your body, your might, your, your finances, your, just your strength, what you have, what you have in your ability, your talents, your soul, that you're with all your, all your might, all your soul, all your, your heart, both between those that, that, that your heart would, and you, your tenderness toward the Lord, that you would not just honor him with what your soul would say. How many of you know you can say things with your lips, but it doesn't, it's not true in the heart? But he says that your heart would match even your lips and the soul, that your words, your adoration would come out and, and you would pour your love on him. And the Bible tells us that one of the ways that we do that, we love him, is when we love others. And so that even the words in our, our words towards others, I just felt that, that, I never even intended to even mention this this morning, just so you know, I'm, this is not part of notes, okay? And we'll get into this, and I had to introduce myself, and that's okay. But here's the deal. I had that real come up strong, that uh, even the soul um, and loving others, because there's, there's just, the, there's some words that are coming out that have been really sharp. And it's, and it's causing a hindrance between, even, between you and the Lord, and you think it's a hindrance between you and them. But it's not. And so love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. When you love with all your soul, you love with your words. And when you love somebody else, the Bible says, whenever you do to these, you're doing it to me. When do we see you in prison? When did we see you thirsty? He said, remember that? When you visited me in prison, when you give a cup of cold water, you do it, you do it unto me. And um, anyway, so, hey, praise the Lord. Hey, I'm Pastor Nate. Glad to have you here. Even if it's your first time, thanks for coming and seeing your kid get dedicated to the Lord and for partnering with you, these wonderful moms and dads. And uh, I, I just say this with me. Say, my children, my grandchildren, their paths are bright. Yes, they are. I agree with that. I agree with that. Proverbs 4. The path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter. If you feel like you, the days ahead are looking dark, well, give your heart to Jesus. If you, have, if you have given your heart to Jesus, he calls you righteous. If you've surrendered your life. And then you have a promise. And that promise is like these seeds. It, it can grow. But will it? It has everything to do with whether or not you'll receive it. See, when we come to church, you know, this is what's so incredible about coming to church. Did you know, my dad used to always say this, yeah, and we're going to jump in here in just a moment. My dad used to say this all the time. He always used to say, and I always kind of thought it was corny, life's like a bowl of raisins, he'd say, raising crops, raising kids, and raising cash. And I was like, uh, uh. But I find myself saying some of the things that my dad uh, uh, said and, and I thought were corny. And I still think they're corny, but for some reason they come out of my mouth. And I'm like, <laughs> damn. Yeah, you know, my kids are like rolling their eyes. And I'm rolling my eyes right with them, but I still say it. I don't know. <laughs> Self-control, I guess. But really in a, in a church, um, when, the, when the Bible talks about how Jesus is the chief shepherd and how he puts uh, even a pastor uh, in the church, they're the shepherd. And um, when we talk about shepherding, uh, it's kind of like farming. So I was thinking about raising, and, and really, we're farming here. Whether, you know, um, it's, that's y'all, right? No, that's me too. Um, Baba talks about sheep and goats and things like that. But we're, we're, we're farming more than sheep. See, what's planted in this house, the seed, the word that comes forth, 
is what you have access to. You, you cannot harvest what's not been planted. This is why it's so important where you go to church. This is why uh, if, if, I, if, I, if I was you, if I, like for me, if I, or I wouldn't say if I was you. For me, I want to partake of things that my heart desires, and yet I can't produce on my own. Yet, the seed can. See, here's the crazy thing. The seed does the work, yet I play a part. And so even in church, you know, what, what's, what, what's, what's, what's planted, and you know, you'll find that in seasons, you know, just as it says in uh, Ecclesiastes, for everything there's a season, you'll find that in seasons in a church that God's planting a certain thing. And, that's, and that's, that's a wonderful thing because you know that when he's planting something, the Bible tells us that his word is like seed. When he's planting something, it's because he is going after a harvest in your and my life. He wants to harvest some things. You know what's so cool? What I found in my heart is the Lord's just talking about renewal of assignment lately. He's been talking a lot about believing God as being bigger. He's talking about miracles, talking about a lot of these things. All in here, but yet there's a lot of seed. How many of you know, like it's the seed bank, right? And there's a lot of options he'd have to be able to pull out and plant in the garden of your heart. But what he's pulling out right now is saying, hey, a season of renewal, what I created you for, you're going to walk in. I, I want to I plant in, into you the, the plans that I have for you. I want to plant into you that you can. I want to plant into you that I haven't taken away the call because you haven't, par you haven't partnered with me yet or you have fall, fallen back. Or He's saying, hey, he's calling back to assignment. He's saying he wants you to harvest that. He wants you to be a part of some miracles. He's, why? Because, because he desires that for you. You know, there's a thousand things we could teach, teach from this pulpit. But you know what? I, I don't just come up with, and teach this last seven years or the stacks of notebooks that I have or now my Google Drive that's probably this thick, you know. But it's thick if it was in paper. I don't pull from that. Lord, what do you want to say right now to these us? Because that's what I find that when I'm speaking here, I'm not speaking here, I'm speaking what he's speaking to me. Yeah. You've heard it said, what's good for the goose, right? It's good for the gander. So here we are, uh, and, and we're in this, this, this series uh, called Fundamentals, all right? So Pastor Nate here, pastor of the church with long, under amazing people, um, but with Jesus, here we are. So our fundamentals has some money. Anytime we talk about money, it's uncomfortable. Um, how many of you know, though, that's kind of like people talk about don't talk about money or religion or politics, right? Those are like the three that you don't want to talk about. However, those are the three things that shape our life. So if we don't talk about them, what we do is we just kind of keep them in the dark. How many of you know where Satan likes to operate? Anybody know where Satan? Not in the light. In the, it's right. So let's just keep that in the dark and just let him Make a mess of our lives. Let's have, let's have a bunch of money fights. Let's ha let, let everything but God lead where we take a job and where we move our family on a whim because there's a little bit more here, a little bit more there, and bring destruction to our family from the place that God set us and directed us because I don't determine where I'm supposed to go or what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to discover it. But we don't, we don't te talk about it enough, the fact that these things, dollars, listen, what you believe in your heart, it determines, well, your eternity. And, and the people that are in office and the people that you and I vote for and those that would take a stand or not take a stand, we keep our beliefs to ourselves. That's trash. And as the church, we will pray for the, the, the government as long as somebody's in office that's not maybe all that we agree with. But as long as things are going well, then we kind of just stop praying because, well, I got Trump in office. That's trash. Nothing ever rested on a man. Like it's on God. He's holding everything in, in place. So he needs God's assistance. I'm not saying Trump's God's man. I'm saying, I'm saying God needs to be a part of everything. He need, these things need to be talked about. Our hearts need to be uh, out there. What we believe needs to be backed. There needs to be actions. 
Anyway, we're talking about fundamentals, and, and it is a series on finances, but what I found, and I'm just going to give you, this is week three, I, I, um, I found that I, it didn't seem like it was so much about money. But yet it is. Everything I'm t- telling you is, is about money, but there's fundamentals, principles that apply to your dollar and to everything. And if we don't get some of these bedrock foundation things in place, we'll never even handle our money properly. Because handling money is not about where it's spent. Handling money is not about just uh, where it's invested. How you handle money is determined by what you believe in your heart. So everything, we're not, gonna, we're not talking about the do. If I get what I believe right, my dues will, will, will be right. If I get this foundation that we talked about in week one, that I serve an omni-God. This is the most foundational thing that we could ever get is in our hearts, is that I serve a God. There is a God, omni, meaning all. He's all-powerful, omniscient, uh, or excuse me, all-knowing, uh, omnipotent, all-powerful. All uh, help me out, I'm getting all mixed up here, but... Um, Let me read it here. Omnipotent, he can do it. That means all powerful. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we should should be in partnership with. And and partnership is, the Bible says, two cannot walk together or partner unless they agree. Agreement's found in your heart. The crazy thing about it is the dollar is what sets our heart. Crazy. The Bible tells us this. You might not believe it, But that doesn't really matter. It matters what you do, but this seed will grow. This seed can grow if you'll receive it. And one of the most fundamental things you and I need to understand is that there is an all-knowing God, okay, omniscient. So that means he has the answer. He all-powerful, that means he can. And omnipresent, that means he is present and aware, yet you still have a part to play, and that is your will, and that's ask. So we have to understand that there is a God that is all-knowing, so he knows all the answers. We talked a little bit about Job and how Job was running his mouth, and the Lord's like, okay. And we, we showed, just kind of talked about the universe and all the things God's created, and if you were to sit, and I was going to say, and start asking you questions, you'd be, but you wouldn't have a lot of answers. But we have one that does. And it's key for us to recognize that I need a coach. The most fundamental thing, the most fundamental thing, if I'm ever going to get the basics, you and I have to understand that we need a coach. We need someone that we're taking directions from. Or let me say it this way, we need to understand authority. I'm going to say that again. We need to understand authority. And we need to yield to authority. And you know who the greatest authority would be? God. That's where I take my cues. That's where you take your cues. And the thing about fundamentals and the thing about coaching, I love to coach. uh, You don't expect the kids to know what you're teaching. But you do expect them to grow. God doesn't expect you to know everything that he said. But he does expect you to grow. And if you take inventory of your life, if you are a child of God, if you've given your heart to Christ, if you've given to the Lord, surrendered your heart, then let me ask you this. How long has it been? And does your life look different? Are you still a baby? Does everything have to be cut up so you don't choke on it? Or can you handle the truth? Because you're not, if you can't, you, there there, there comes a point when milk is just not enough. And the change you desire and the empowerment to live your life and not just, in a sense, be vegetative or or, uh, um, not empowered to fulfill your purpose, not enough energy to go out and be about and do all the things that God has designed you for, it's going to take some sustenance. It's going to take the Word of God. Because he, here, listen, He doesn't expect you to know it all, but He does expect you to grow. And growth comes from adjustments, from change. Romans chapter 12 tells us that 
don't be conformed, but be changed, but be transformed. I hope that some of the things that you believed at day one, or maybe that you didn't have the answer to, you now have heard what God has said and therefore called it the answer and planted it in your heart, and maybe are you're walking into some of those things now. Like, maybe you heard about how the God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. And then when you recognize fear in your house, that you could take authority over that. And then what you're wrestling with is not just your wife. Sometimes you wish that was the only thing you were wrestling with. But that's not what you all... Listen, it's, you're not just wrestling against flesh and blood. You wrestle against principalities, powers. In other words, there's an assignment to bring destruction in your life. And it's key that we would recognize that instead of just getting caught up, squabbling amongst ourselves and letting him go unchecked. Okay? So that was week one was just really talking about God being all-powerful. And just about two more minutes review, okay? <laughs> and last week, or two weeks ago, we talked about how you're a builder. And I, and I want to I wanna throw this up real quick, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. Um, this is Paul talking to the church at Corinth, and he says, hey, when we come to you, we speak the truth of God's word, and this is what happens. He says, though we live in this, uh, okay, okay, though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. So there's some things going on in our life that, we're, that need to change. There's some natural things, there's some, but, but the way that you and I are to fight and, and to get the, the, the things of the natural to change, it, it's found in the word. Okay, here's what he says. Next verse. The weapons, the tools that you and I have at our disposal that we're to be fighting with, fighting meaning to advance, okay, are not of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to, de to demolish strongholds. Now, what is, a str what is he talking about? There are things or thoughts that you have formulated in your mind, a lot of times, see, when God speaks, he speaks to your heart. The wisdom that comes from above is heard in your heart. Right. Satan speaks, and he speaks reason. And the Bible tells us that as a man thinks, so is he, right? So God speaks here, and you have the choice to let this become truth or not. But so here's what's happening. He says when God's word speaks, when, when, God, when you come, Paul says that we're coming to you with, with weapons that are not of this world. We're coming to you the, uh, uh, with a weapon that's mighty from, from God, and it has the ability to pull down the stronghold that you built in your mind. Right. You're saying, you built, yeah, that's what we are talking about. You're the builder, Satan's not. Right. Here's the deal. The, the thoughts that you think are the choices that you made to call truth. Yeah. Based upon what you see, or based upon your thought, based upon whatever he, and he's a great deceiver, He'll get you to look at it and he'll, he'll get you to look at something. He'll talk all about that and, and he'll even, he'll dupe you even with the words that he says that God says and, and he's twisting it. And then if you take that as truth, what he does is you, in a sense, you take that, that truth, that word, Legos, Legos is word, Lego, right? Like a building block and you place that if you could just imagine your mind like, like a, you were to look at from a bird's eye view, round. And in the middle of your mind, you build a, a, a truth, to you, okay, of what the enemy has said. And, and, and after a little bit of time, what happens is, in this big circle, there's this little fort built in the middle of your mind, or a stronghold. And see, this stronghold is, is key for the enemy to, to, to dwell in the, the, the safety of your own thoughts and wreak havoc. And you don't know... I would say, <laughs> probably it fits there, but it probably sounds like cussing. But you don't know what in the world is going on. You don't know what in the devil is going on. But it's the way you think. It's the strongholds that you've received. And as a man thinks, that's the way he will be. So, while we're in this world, guess what? There's a constant pressure to conform. There's all kinds of things that are trying to tell you how to think. Kids, on, right here, there's, there, the school's trying to tell you how to think. What's okay? What's not okay? Guess what? This right here 
is what to tell you how to think. Because this came from the Creator. This came from your coach that understands you don't know it all, that we don't know it all, but wants you to grow. Why? Because He wants you and I to be fruitful or to partake of things that He designed for us to have. Man, thankful for that. And so what does He do? He, he, with these strongholds, there's strongholds in our mind that, that maybe you've ever heard of people like their family cursed, right? There's just a way that they think, kind of like I talk about raising kids, raising crops, raising, you know, my dad, like it just kind of wears off on me, even though I intend not to say it somehow. <sighs> you know, like, right? How many of you know there's some things that, that maybe your family was raised in, maybe, maybe there's some sexual vice. And this is why also it's so important, mom and dad, grandpa and grandpa, grandma, um, what you're planning, planting, because your kids, they have access to what you sow. Oh, I don't want them to eat that. Well, <laughs> you planted the corn all around the house. I think they might grab an ear or two. And the thing about seed is, seed's made to multiply. But, the cool thing is, is even if there's a stronghold in your or my life, there is a weapon given to us to tear down what the enemy would love to work from or work with. And that's called the Word of God. So I'm a, I'm a builder. You're a builder. Am I building a stronghold or am I building the wall around to keep the enemy out? And when I say keep the enemy out, it's not around your mind, it's around your heart. See, when I, it's the shield of faith that you would be able to quench every dart of the wicked one. See, what hides, behind, what hides behind the shield of faith is both your heart and your mind. And so when you receive what God's word says, there's something that's more powerful than your mind, and that's your heart. You ever heard somebody talk about so that? Man, that guy's got a lot of heart. It doesn't matter. It, it, like, it, when somebody's got that on the inside, it, this, this is not so much of a factor because they're going to get after it. They're gonna, and your heart will keep you longer than your mind could ever tell you to. Heart, there's the strength of the heart. Maybe you've heard that story. I think it's Secretariat. How many of you have ever heard that story of the horse? And that was the fastest horse and all this. And, they, and it ended up dying and they found out why it was the fastest horse. It's because its heart was two times the size. Right? They're like, well, that's why it was winning. Because it's heart. Because the heart is the key. More than the drive of the mind. The heart is the key. All right, and so we're a builder, and where the enemy's built, thank God we have a weapon for us that we have access to right here. This is why the enemy would like you to keep it on the shelf and keep you in, keep it in the bank instead of in your heart, because he wants to wage war from in your mind. Okay, so these are some of the most fundamental things that that we got to understand, and and when God's speaking. Versus when the enemy's speaking, that's what we got to at the end of the end of last week, and we talked about in Genesis 14 when there was two kings, uh, or, or the story is when Abram uh, found out that Lot had got taken, uh, and Lot or Abram went after these kings that took Lot, and and he defeated them, took all the spoil of war, and Lot and all the kids and everybody back, and they're coming back to his homeland, and the king of Sodom is in the hills, and he sees Abram coming with all the spoils of war, and he comes out to meet Abram. So Abram's out in this valley. It's called the Valley of Kings, okay? And so he's out in this valley, and here comes this king, king of Sodom, and that does mean something, okay? Think of Sodom and Gomorrah. You got a, the, basically a picture of the world here, a king of the world here. You got Abraham, which is another king. He's the father of our faith, okay? Uh, a king and a priest, the Bible calls children of God, okay? And so here you have this other king, and you have this other one, Right, and that shows up after Sodom, King of Sodom, there and Abram's there, and his name is Melchizedek, King of Salem, King of Peace, and he brings out, uh, uh, he says, wine and bread, and he lays it before Abram, and he blesses Abraham or Abram at that time, and he says, "Blessed be Abraham, God most high, of God most high," and and Abram gives tithes of all. 
So we understand that even in our finances, there's something about recognizing presence. That you don't ever give to be blessed. The blessing came, but you do give to partner. So here's a huge thing that we do. This is the foundational thing for you and I to understand that what I give to, I partner with. What I give to, I actually partner, I partner with. This is what's happening. If you read this story in Genesis 14, I don't have time to go to all of it, but this would be great homework or devotional time later on so that you would own it for yourself and therefore be able to carry it. How many of you know you can't swing somebody else's sword, but you were able to own this, and the fact that Sodom, the world picture, is there, and here comes Jesus, here comes Melchizedek, the king of peace, blood, or not blood, bread and wine, and, he, and the king of Sodom's like, why are you going to give stuff to him for, what, for a blessing? Or why, why is his presence and you partnering with him more valuable than me, the king over all? I just defeated all five armies, right? Or, or you just defeated all five armies. I had four on my side. So now this whole valley is mine. How about you give me some of that stuff and you keep this for yourself? And Abram says, I'm not partnering with you. I'm not giving you one dime. Lest you say that I made you rich. He said, I'm not going to give. I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not keeping, or excuse me, I'm not keeping anything for myself that you said, I'm going to allow you to have this. Or I'm not, I'm not going to partner with you. I'm not going to enter covenant today with you. I enter covenant today with this other one. I enter partnership today with this other king, Melchizedek. So it's huge to, for us to understand that what I partner with, I, I, um, or what I give to, I partner with. So that was week one and week two. So you ready for week three? I know we don't have that much time, but praise the Lord. <laughs> we'll just get started on it, because I guess what? I get next week too. I, told, I said, hey, Landon, I'm going to teach next week too. Here's what I want to, and it really sets up really nice, because I don't have to go very far. Uh, the title of this morning's message would be this, uh, Growing Up. Growing up. You know, it's funny, as you and I grow up, there's a stage in which uh, we all begin to develop into, and that's called talking. And a lot of times, you know, if you take your kid to the doctor and maybe say they're four or five and they did the stutter or whatever, we had uh, one of our middle guys, he would get so excited he couldn't get it all out and he doesn't stutter at all anymore, and so we now make fun of him. Um, as every good family would, but then we say make fun of them, which is like, hey, 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 I want some watermelon and, and cow, anyway, anyway, so we make, we make fun of them, not because of somebody else stutters, but, but he's so cute, and we, these videos that we have, they're precious to us, because we see even just the Lord do a work in his life. So it's just something, and he just looks so cute when he does it in his little cowboy hat and boots that he'd wear everywhere, shorts and diaper, whatever. Anyway, there's this, there's this, a lot of times we look at a child's speech based, and we say, yeah, doctors will say, oh, they're not advancing enough because they should be here, right? How many know what I'm talking about? And then we get to this next place. Um, and so, you know, as you grow up in Christ and as you learn what his word says, and, um, and, you, and you open your heart to what he has to say, um, what, what you'll find is uh, there'll be some things that change in the way that you speak. You'll begin to speak what he says in the midst of, and this is, this is elementary, by the way. This is not like super spiritual. If you see somebody that says what God says or that out of their mouth comes a promise that they're believing God for, he says, even he, when he said, Lord, teach us how to pray, we don't know a thing. Okay? He says, okay, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done here on this earth. So it's very elementary to pray God's will. And this is God's will. Okay? So as you begin to walk with God, what you'll find is that your speech, you'll begin to develop, and when some of the, you'll begin to talk, and sometimes, uh, you know, as your kid's first word is buck, or whatever it might be. It might be daddy. It might be mama. Um, I like to hunt. So you walk, take the kid over to the deer, and you're like, buck, buck, right? So, you know, put his, let him rub the fur, you know. 
Train a child in the way he should go, right? <laughs> but there are, there are some first words. As you, uh, the God's so good. There are things that he'll, he'll, he'll know that you'll need that's so foundational to your, to your development. Even right now today, the, the things that are going on in your life, there's a word for you that is, is so important and so key for your advancement. Yeah. Right here. And you'll, you'll find that, that may, it'll be a word if you spend time with, with him, he'll begin to speak to you. And you'll find that over and over and over, it's, it always has to do with that. That's always spoken. Some, you read something that was totally not about that, but yet somehow it had to do with that. Why? Because God's good. Because he's a good father. And so as you get to this next point, I'm going somewhere because I don't understand how much time we have. I get that. Um, and this is one of the few times I've looked at the clock. You're welcome. <laughs> but you get to this next stage where you're not maybe stuttering as much or, and, and you know how to formulate what you, what you have in your heart. You, no, I want that one. You know, you got it. And you get to this stage, this teenage stage. How many of you, and you know, a lot of times, and I think the majority of the church, I'm just saying, we're stuck in a teenage stage, not growing up. This is one of the stages that can last, you know, and we see in, the, in our modern uh, day era, we see teenagers uh, at 35 still living in mom and dad's house. Now, am I, am I hammering on you? No, I'm saying this is the culture which we're living in. This is conforming, okay? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with living at mom and dad's house. You're going to help pay the bill. I mean, you know, pull your weight. Okay. And that's just something, the season that God has you in or whatever. That, that, okay. But here's the deal. You were created to be fruitful and multiply. Okay. So that takes you getting out and, you know, okay. Um, but you have this teenage stage. And here's what a teenager likes to do. I was one. So I'm not going to use my kids as an example. I'm going to use myself. Uh, we know how to talk back. You know what's crazy, though? One of the number one ways as a teenager, you and I talk back. We don't talk back to God like this. You, blah, 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 blah. We're just more like this. <laughs> we don't say, yeah, whatever, God. Yeah, whatever. Talk, you know, whatever. I don't know what you talk to. You know, I don't <laughs> think you know everything. We don't talk, and we don't formulate sentences. You know, how do we do it? Murmuring. Yeah. You know, it's been a while since I've been a kid, but I have kids too. But I remember myself, and I've seen this also emulated in my own kids. When you tell your kids something, let's just think about Job. Who is this? I want to, I want to just see this. This will be probably, uh, we'll use two verses this morning, and then we'll pick up next time. Job 38, verse 2. This is how I feel sometimes when I'm talking to my kids, and I'm sure my dad felt when he was talking to me. Who is this who darkens counsel by the words without knowledge? In other words, I just told you to do something, and I, know, I can see the end from the beginning because I'm your father, right? And you're arguing back with me? Who do you think you are? But here's the thing. There's no argument. Because the argument's like this. And so here's my response. What'd you say? <laughs> oh. What did you say? What did they say? <laughs> yes! <laughs> you nailed it! What did you say? Nothing. This is the same thing Job said when God called him on the carpet and he, fought, he learned that, hey, guess what? I'm going to repent. As you look through Job 38 and all the way through 40, you'll see that he, he, God calls him out and shows him all these things that he knows the answers to, but he doesn't have a clue about. And you're talking to me about this? And you're murmuring and you're complaining and you're saying what? Nothing. So hold on, hold on. This is what's crazy. How many decisions are you and I making based upon? How many? 
How many decisions are we making based upon? You think you got to come through? I mean, I can. You know, I deserve it. Like, like you think you guys prayer? It must not even work. It's stupid going to church. Doesn't even pay to serve God. I can't believe people even tie. I believe that crap. No, 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 no. What'd you say? Nothing. Really? Because you're. What's gotten in your heart? What's gotten, what's controlling your mind, what's, what's the, the stronghold up here, no, 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 it's controlling your life. So how do I know what's going on in here and going on in here? What did you say? What did you say? And, and, and we're going to look at this next time, but we're going to look at Malachi. You're saying, oh, okay, we're going to talk about tithing and, and, and giving offerings and all that Old Testament stuff. Let me just pause you real quick because we already went all the way to Abram, okay, which is way before the law ever existed, okay? And then Jesus, whose standard, if you're going to live under grace, he said, um, okay, you say don't kill. I say you call your brother a fool. You're a murderer. So what standard is higher, grace or law? Grace. So if you want to live under grace, that would be awesome. See me afterwards. We'll just double or triple what Malachi says and see how that goes for you. What did you say? Nothing. But what you'll find is Malachi, uh, in the, it's actually the last book of the Old Testament. You'll find that it really translates to today. And, this, and just so you know, these books are books of prophecy. These are written by Old Testament. Help me out. What are they? Prophets. You know what a prophet speaks? God's Word. Did you know that you can read Ezekiel, the, pro, the, the prophet? And it talks about the exact day in which we're living. Prophecies being fulfilled as we breathe undeniable. Did you know, and I would challenge you to go ahead and read this before we get into it next week. It's only four chapters, three and a half chapters. Uh, Malachi, one, two, three, four, four and a half. There's only eight, six verses in the fourth chapter. Read it. Read chapter four and you tell me that this isn't where we're living and Jesus is coming back. And he's talking about Jesus' return in chapter four. But here's this thing that you're going to see over and over and over and over again. And I'm closing with this. You'll find this statement. And you could circle it yourself. And I encourage you to. Yet you say. It starts out like this. Malachi. And Malachi means this. They, they actually, histor- like scholars don't even know that this was a person. You're saying Malachi was a prophet. Malachi means messenger. Angel. It could be translated. It's a messenger. That's what Malachi, the name Malachi means. So it was written by a messenger. Not necessarily, they can't identify who Malachi was because this is all that Malachi wrote. Like there's no other history to prove that this was a man that was stood in the office of a prophet and brought God's word here and there and there. No, it was just like how the Bible tells us many times we entertain angels and we don't even know it. Here's a word sent by a messenger from God and here's what he says. Listen, he says, I got a word, verse 1, I got a burden of the word of the Lord. In other words, there's a heavy thing on my heart. That I must speak. Listen. He says this. I have loved you, said the Lord. And it starts like this. It says, yet you say. How do you love us? Yet you say. There's a response all through this that talks about us talking back to God. And you know what they say? God says, yet you say. And then then we say, how do I say that? I didn't say that. I didn't say I had an attitude. What are you talking about? I didn't say that. I said I was going to go clean my room. No, no, you didn't. 
No, you know, you didn't. Guys, there's a lot of talking going on. There's a lot of murmuring going on. There's a lot of you say. And it would be good for us to open our mouth and say what we said. Because he, he's asking this morning, what, are you, what did you say? Can this grow? Can this grow? Yes. What did you say? Yes. Can this grow? Yes. No, will, will this grow? What? Yes. The thing about murmuring is this. It's not just that it'll keep you out of the promised land. It'll keep the very thing, God's word, from being able to enter your heart. You ever try to put a hose on a spigot when the water's turned on? In nice clothes, maybe? It's kind of a mess, isn't it? It takes us stopping for a moment. Maybe not uttering a thing to connect with what God is saying because He loves His children. He loves us. And part of growing up is beginning to recognize when my Father says something, it's because He loves me. As I get older and as I see my own children grow up, I realize how much, not how much my dad didn't get right, not how much my dad did get right, I realize how much my father loved me. And that is what is so key, that, that understanding, he's talking to me because he loves me. That's fundamental for me. That's most basic for me to understand if I'm going to handle the dollars that God's put in my hand well. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for this service that we were able to come together. Thank you for the children that walked and the parents that walked across the stage this morning and entered a covenant with you. Lord, we just, we just speak grace to them in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word this morning to us. I thank you that you even still are sharpening it. And we just thank you that not a word that was spoken, not a word of your word won't accomplish what it was set forth to do. Thank you for showing up today, for speaking to our hearts. Thank you for giving us ears that hear and recognize your voice. Just say that. Say, I hear. I heard God speak to me today. You might be sitting there right now and you're hearing God speak about getting your, giving your heart to Him. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus or in your heart you, you know the Lord's knocking on that. He's speaking to your heart and saying, I want you to dedicate your life to me. I want you to give your heart to me. Maybe it's the first time. Maybe it's uh, you're coming back to Jesus. Maybe you're here because... You got to see a child get dedicated, but he was all excited. God was excited about seeing his child come home. On either one of those occasions, if that's you, and you got to give your heart to Jesus this morning because you're hearing him speak to you, I want you to lift your hand. Lift your hand bold and strong. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, I see your hand, buddy. Anybody else? Thank you, Father. Thank you. I see your hand, man.
right where you're at. No, 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 not right where you're at. I'll ask us to stand. We're going to close. I gave that invitation. I saw the hands raised. And I'm going to close this morning's service by also inviting anyone that needs healing in their body to come forward. The Bible says, the Bible says, I will heal. Okay. Uh, if you need healing in your body or you need agreement in prayer, if to agree, touch, touching anything, it will be done. And uh, if you need prayer, healing in your body, I'm going to invite you to come up over here. And if you raise your hand to give your heart to Jesus, I'm going to, I want you to come down to the altar. This is a place of covenant. And even what I'm saying in a prayer we talk about coming down to this altar and we talk about coming together in agreement. Guess who was at the altar? Not just a person. You're, you're coming out and you're saying, God, you're here. I understand God can be anywhere where two are gathered. He's there in the midst of them. But there's something about us saying, God, I'm coming down to put you in remembrance and enter a covenant with you concerning my healing in my body, concerning the promise of provision, considering knowing what I'm supposed to do, hearing your voice or laying my life down before you. Amen.